Oh boy, disclaimer! Welcome folks, one and all, to Bandison's Treehouse of Horror 33 review. Continue watching, if you dare. <laughs> Hello Banson, everyone here. Last year's Treehouse of Horror instalment was, for a lack of a better word, flawed. It certainly had some promise, but the attempt to cram five segments into one episode, even if one of them was the damn intro, led to each segment severely lacking in time. This meant that every segment felt rushed and none of them reached the potential that they could have. This year the writers seem to have learned their lesson, not only giving Not It a full length episode, which I did a review on the other day, but also resorting back to just three segments in the episode. Did it work? Let's take a look. So unlike every other Treehouse instalment thus far, this one doesn't feature an intro. Instead we just see a book with the title card on it which then opens and we get right into the first segment. 32 previous instalments have had an intro, with the 27th one having two for some reason, so it's a little odd that this instalment lacks one. But I don't really mind if it gives each segment more time to breathe and fully flesh out their stories. Being honest, I actually like the simplicity of this. It not only looks nice with the skull candle and ink quill, but it makes the segments come across as a bunch of scary stories, which is essentially what the Treehouse episode started as. Simple, but effective. If the title wasn't obvious enough, our first segment is a parody of The Babadook, one of my all-time favourite horror movies. I don't know why the writers are struggling with their titles these days. The Puka Duke? What's with all the titles sounding like they were named by preschoolers? So the segment begins with Marge deciding to read Maggie a bedtime story, eventually selecting the Puka Duke because the book keeps reappearing on the shelf. After the book scares Maggie, Marge tears up the book before throwing it in the trash, only for it to knock on her door the next morning. She tries to burn it, but accidentally inhales the smoke it causes, allowing her to be possessed by the Puka Duke. Seeing a baby being hunted down by her own mother, the one person she is meant to see as a protector, is morbidly unnerving. It's a nice change of pace to see Maggie as the innocent victim for a change, instead of her being the evil entity. March herself is also pretty spooky, with her creepy shadow and all. I admit, she doesn't look that different, but that adds to the scare factor in my opinion. Aside from the occasional bout of madness, Marge is always the face of reason and optimism, so seeing her with a sinister grin on her face is something we never really see. I feel if they overdid it, it would have felt silly or gimmicky. The animation is nice, especially when the book is on screen. The animators did a great job in making a creepy pop-up book look good, and the book's menacing pictures look fantastic. Maggie herself is adorable in this episode, and I found myself really rooting for her. Seeing such an innocent baby being tormented like this is gut-wrenching. Seeing her desperately trying to ask her family for help gave me an unexpected tug on my heartstrings. At one point she manages to tie up Marge and show her several sentimental things to break her possession, but none of them work. Instead, she allows herself to be caught by her and then strokes her cheek, which finally beats the possession. Then Marge sucks up the Puka Duke with a vacuum cleaner. This segment isn't very funny, I must admit, but I personally don't think it needed to be. Why? Because it hits all the right emotions throughout. The best bit about this segment is the relationship between Marge and Maggie and how that relationship is utilised to get across the spooks and feels. Seeing Maggie desperately flick through the family photo album only to find it full of photos of Marge missing out on all the fun the family has kind of got to me on an emotional level. Marge puts up with so much crap from her family and seeing it illustrated in this manner made me really feel bad for her. You know, a cartoon drawing. Yeah. I'm not sure that's what they were going for, but if it was, they nailed it. Maybe I'm reading too much into a silly little Halloween segment, but for me, the emotions and creepiness were well done here. I'm giving the Puka Duke a 9 out of 10. It's got good animation, a great story, plenty of time to flesh out its premise, decent creepiness and some surprisingly emotional moments. Being honest, I'm baffled. It was way better than I thought it would be. Ah, 
I admit I feel a bit out of place with this one because I have no interest in manga whatsoever and when it comes to anime my expertise ends at Pokemon, Beyblade and Digimon. So I apologise in advance but I'm not going to be a great judge of how good a parody this segment will be of its source material. Death Tome is a parody of Death Note, a manga series about some kid that discovers a book that belonged to a Shinigami? A go what? Death Tome is a parody of Death Note, a manga series about some kid that discovers a book that belonged to a Shinigami, a god or spirit of death in Japanese culture. I think. I don't know. Turns out the guy can kill people by writing out their deaths into the book and he uses this ability to try and create a crime free world by killing off the scumbags of society. And that's essentially what Death Tome gives us, only with Lisa as the protagonist. I may as well start by addressing the elephant in the room. The animation is stunning. Whilst I'm not an anime fan, I am the first to admit I love the style of animation used for it. Anime animators always do a great job of taking their style to the next extreme and seeing what new levels they can take the imagination to. Seeing the Simpsons characters as anime characters is very beautiful and they all look how I would expect them to. The backdrops used throughout are also visually stunning, especially the city scenes. And the animation of the Shinigami, named Steve Johnson, is great too. I was a bit shocked they didn't try and shoehorn in the random side character to represent Steve, but I'm happy they didn't as it gives us an original character. Being honest, there isn't really much to say about the plot as it follows the manga pretty closely, from what I can tell at least. Just replace a smart teenager with a smart 8 year old and you're set. Oh, and instead of trying to rid the world of criminals, Lisa instead uses the book to kill members of a corporation that are trying to cause global warming which may destroy the world. Because the book's rules insist that you can't use the same method of death twice, we do get some fun and original kill scenes, such as a lion jumping out of the toilet, a woman getting sucked into a plane engine, and some guy dying of embarrassment. Mr Burns' death is pretty funny too. The most peaceful way to go. This segment does try a bit harder with its comedy and it does work to a degree. I like the chemistry between Lisa and Steve as they have some good banter. Really? A toilet gator? I was running out of ideas! But much like Not It, a lot of the comedy is obvious to say the least. The third act also falls flat on its ass. An anonymous tipster informs the authorities that somebody is using the book to kill off all the corporation members and by anonymous tipster I of course mean Bart. Gee, who didn't see that coming? Turns out he discovered this after reading Lisa's diary. Who the hell would write this in a diary? It looks as if she's about to use the book to kill Bart, but instead uses it to kill Steve. Then she transforms into a Shinigami for some reason and just wanders off with Bart. Um, isn't there some important things that still need to be discussed? Bart was literally just about to report you to the authorities. Your sister is now a friggin' death god? Wanna talk about either of those issues? No? Okay. I'll give Death Tome a 7 out of 10. It's stunningly animated, has some good humour here and there, and has a nice concept for its plot, but some of the humour is obvious to a blind Martian and the third act really hurts it. Simpsons World begins in 1993 with Marge vs the Monorail. Sort of. Two dweebs then enter the screen and Homer starts acting erratic after they give him beer. Turns out that this isn't an episode of The Simpsons at all, but in fact an attraction at Simpsons World. Simpsons World is a Simpsons themed theme park where animatronic versions of The Simpsons characters act out random scenes from the TV show for visitors to be a part of. Turns out Monorail Homer has gone crazy and is shut down to be taken to a tech facility to be repaired. Whilst there he wakes up and becomes self aware after altering his programming and then resurrects his family so they can escape. This is an awesome segment. It's a parody of Westworld, another show I've yet to see so I'm not sure how closely it follows its source material but being honest it's good enough as is. Being set in a Simpsons themed theme park, we get treated to a lot of nostalgic and memorable moments from the show's history, such as Old Man Yells at Cloud, Lisa's Pony, Camp Krusty, The Home Where They Fall, The Land of Chocolate, Hank Scorpio, Testing, Maud Flanders' Death, and the B Sharps. Even the Homer Simpson hedge meme is mentioned. Get your fat bum in that hedge! Meme! 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 meme. That's enough for Bart to alter their programming settings, allowing the clan to attack humans which they do in several fun and violent ways. The episode isn't just a nostalgia circle jerk though, and has some brilliant suspense and eeriness to it. To stop the Simpsons droids from escaping the park, officials send a fleet of Ralph Wiggum robots after them with surprisingly spooky results. I 
Who would have thought that Ralph Wiggum could be creepy? It's also got some great comedy moments. I love how Lisa becomes so self-aware that she starts having a panic attack. Homer deciding to crush all the robots of his own father is morbidly funny, and Homer accidentally killing the two technicians in the lab made me chuckle. The family escape in a prototype of Marge's car that she stole. It seems that they have managed to get away safely, ending up in Bob's Burgers from, well, Bob's Burgers. I admit, seeing Linda Belcher appearing made my jaw drop. I love it when popular animated sitcoms do crossovers. Then, in a shockingly dark twist, the camera zooms out to show the family are simply now stuck inside a Bob's Burgers themed theme park. Then the camera zooms out and we see many other theme parks based on South Park, Spongebob, Futurama, Family Guy, Rick and Morty, and Big Mouth. It's a fun end to a fun segment. The episode then ends with Kang and Kodos finishing the book that depicts the segment, only to be spooked out when they can see themselves reading the book at the end. It's a fun way to incorporate Kang and Kodos into the episode. I'm giving Simpsons World an 8 out of 10. It's a fun nostalgia fest for longtime fans of the show with enough comedy to expand it to more than just a fan service. Adds a surprisingly creepy element and a pretty cool crossover, and you have a solid segment. I was pleasantly surprised with this year's Treehouse instalment. I'm really glad that they gave the time each segment needed to fulfil their potential. The result is three well-written and animated segments with memorable moments, fun violence and intriguing concepts. Yeah, Death Tome had a duff ending, but there was a lot to enjoy here. Some might be gutted that they didn't have a proper intro this year, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't, but I feel it helped the episode in the long run, giving the writers plenty of time to work with. Treehouse of Horror 33 gets an 8.5 out of 10 from me. It's well written, and the segments are so good that even if you haven't seen their source material, you can still get some enjoyment out of them. Add to that some beautiful animation, great voice work, great laughs, and great violence, and you have one of the strongest Treehouse episodes in recent years. And that's it for this review and this video. Do you agree with me or do you think I'm a slider short of some self-awareness? What do you think of Treehouse of Horror 33? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Banterson, stay humble, and I'll see you soon.